works in uh, Sansarine, who's the director of influencer and creators at impact.com, uh, here to talk about how to correctly uh, compensate your influencers. Take it away. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Um, for those who have not yet met, my name is Santorin and I'm with Impact.com as the director for influencers and uh, creators partnership solution uh, within EMEA. And today, I really hope that I can spark some inspiration as we talk about the ins and outs of uh, influencer compensation. We all really want to build a successful influencer campaign and understand that the right creators can either make it for your brand or break it for your brand. But what are the elements that can go above and beyond and really help us power that influencer campaign? It's really hard to strike a balance between creator incentives and marketing budgets in general. But getting it right can get you a serious leg up on the competition. So you really need to take this holistic approach to your influencer program. And this approach starts with two ingredients. A, the best creators, and B, the best incentives. Creators need incentives that would really attract them and inspire them. And to fine tune these incentives and get the most out of your program, you really need to know the value of the creator's influence, their audience, and the usage and exclusivity rights that you can negotiate. Now this comprehensive approach builds long lasting relationships that will allow your brand to pull together an elite group of brand ambassadors and brand promoters. Influencers who show credibility, express authenticity, and who really make content that's gonna excite you and your customers. So what's in it for the brands and the influencers? They can both win big with this approach. One women's activewear brand took their top performers from a year-long campaign and recruited them into a powerful brand ambassadorship program that's still paying off today. A buy now, pay later company uh, used a six month retainer period as a launch pad to build those relationships with the influencers and their brand ambassador program to do everything from social posting, blog posts, emails, as well as TV ads. These achievements were built on a bedrock of fair compensation and you won't really have long term success without it. So let's start with the basics. How can you hone your compensation package and really attract the best creators. You need to know what you need from them and what you have to offer. This starts with your channel's budget as a whole. It helps to break it down, right? Break it down into time, resources, and influencer payments. So you really need time to manage the project, budget for technology to optimize your efforts, and define that budget for influencer payments. You can adjust these three factors to really maximize the budget that you have available for influencers. As an example, if you spend less on some of the manual processes and internal expenses, you can free up budget for influencers and in other words, automate the manual aspects of your campaign. As an example, if we take a standard campaign, we can look and estimate at around 5 to 15 hours that it would take per influencer throughout the life cycle of that campaign. And with the use of an end-to-end -end technology, you can automate all the aspects that may be manual and time-consuming to really maximize influencer output. And as for the influencer budget, you need to take into account the cost of content creation. And this is quite important out there. You really need to think about influencers as their own businesses, because they rightfully are. Any business has a running cost, and any influencer that may have half a million or a million followers they probably have a studio of their own, they have photographers that they need to compensate and all other expenses that they really need to make sure that they meet to run their business. And while framing an influencer as a business is true for large influencers, the same goes for micro influencers as well. They may not have those costs on a fixed basis, but there's still costs for travel, photo editing and so forth. So it's only fair to pay them accordingly as you would any other business with running expenses. And if the cost of producing content eats too deeply into influencer compensation, they may feel squeezed and could move on to other clients. Remember, their clients are your competition. So you really need to understand these costs to help you understand the creator so that both of you arrive at a price 
that's satisfactory for all parties involved. This will really help build a strong and productive relationship, which will help the brand and the influencer go into a long, uh, long-standing relationship into the future. Let's look at this interesting stat for a minute. 82% of consumers are highly likely to follow a micro-influencer's recommendation. Now, why is that? Any ideas? I know it's a bit loud in here for you guys to shout out, so I'll sort of skip ahead and tell you one of the big things is brand love. And this is really when brands engage with influencers who create authentic content and really partner with influencers that truly align with their brand. And that authenticity really resonates with audiences for the influencers as well as for brands. And that's really that something that we should all be aiming for. What helpful aspects can a brand look at to measure their pull with these influencers? One of the big ones and the simple ones is engagement rate. Simply put, influencers with higher engagement rate are more effective at convincing fans to follow their recommendations. And these can vary from creator to creator. The smaller influencers that have higher engagement rates, as opposed to larger influencers that may have lower engagement rates, just because from a smaller influencer's perspective, they have the time and the resource to actually communicate on a one-to-one -one basis with their audiences. And that's really something that's quite powerful as it drives 22 times more product-related conversations per week. So really by factoring engagement rates into your recruitment and compensation decisions, you will ultimately maximize the effectiveness of your campaign. And the audience you want to reach will affect your choices as well. So consider your target market. Are you a high-end brand? Look for a creator attracting an audience with luxury, trying to reach the younger audiences, teenagers, seek out for young celebrities or creators with young audiences. It all eventually comes back to the brand love. You really want your audience to resonate with content, the message that's being sent across, and the influencers that a brand is putting out for themselves. And building that loyalty from day one will pay off in the long run. And with your ideal customer in mind, you can examine the demographics of um, the influencers and whether they're the right fit to help activate your brand and achieve your goals. And of course, size matters, but not always in the way that you might think. Both large and small creators can help you reach your goals. It depends on the audience you're trying to reach. So as an example for that, if you think of a makeup brand, you might have a large influencer that might have a very large reach achieve that scale for awareness. Whereas if you're gearing up for a target audience that focuses on cosplayers for going to Comic-Con and you know the, the makeup that they do to dress up and look like those characters, those may have very niche influencers that would be highly engaged with their audiences. So really they're attracting a more engaged fan base in that case as well. So in that, in that aspect, the really the rate that you could pay for an influencer, again, varies depending upon their audience size, the engagement rate, as I've discussed so far. Whereas one has massive reach, the other has a higher engagement. So really it's about ba balancing the benefits and the drawbacks for each of these and really seeing which of this audience size, as well as the compensation package, really fits for the needs of your organization and the campaign strategy. There you go. Now let's look at an element that is often overlooked. Content usage rights. Influencers may create content promoting a brand's products and services, but brands do not own this content. The influencers and the creators do. The right to use this content in other forms must be negotiated with the creators, and it's often smart to do so at the beginning of the engagement with influencers. Usage rights extend the value of influencer partnerships for brands and they really allow to use influencer content beyond the scope of the initial campaign. Such as that content can be repurposed on the brand's website, paid social ads, uh, on their you know, email blasts or even any advertising that sits outside social or digital for that matter of fact. 
this can really help brands save money on content creation as well. So you see that there is that whole holistic aspect towards this. If a fashion brand launches a new clothing line with an influencer campaign and the influencer content does well, engages with the right audiences, this can then be repurposed to show off the items in an email blast. Oops. Here we go. Think on the head. Sorry about this. Perfect. So how do buying rights actually work? These are often sold for either a limited time span or in perpetuity. And these options come in with very different costs. How you plan to use the content will also change the rate that's being charged for it. So when buying rights for a specific piece of content, the rule of thumb is to pay the creator 30% of the sponsored rate for each month that the ad is going to be used. So an example of that is, let's say the original sponsored post was a few hundred pounds and you plan to use that as a brand for three months once the campaign has been run out. You could probably look at about double the amount of what was initially negotiated for that sponsored rate in the post. And when you're buying these rights in perpetuity, the usual standard rate is to pay three times the sponsored rate. An example for that is if someone is being awarded a thousand pounds for sponsored rate uh, for a piece of content, and if the brand wants to own that content right for perpetuity, you'd be looking at brand paying about two to three thousand pounds for that. But as I said, it's quite important and smart to do all of these negotiations upfront, but always be mindful of the fact that you're not negotiating rights of the content without any strategy in plan. Because it does come at a cost, it's always wise to think about how this content will be repurposed, where you will use it, and have a sound content strategy behind that. And at this point, you might be wondering, how does this all come together when determining influencer compensation? So in regards to the makeup brand example that I gave before, if they're finding that creator that's fairly niche and you know has uh, a very engaged audience, but a small audience size and higher engagement rate, their, for their purpose, they would usually accept a flat fee to cover you know, the expenses that they have, but then also uh, an opportunity to develop a hybrid model and sort of introduce bonus payments as performance parts for them. And as you can see, a cost for a single Instagram can range from a few hundred pounds to a few hundred thousand pounds, depending on the audience size of the, uh, of the influencer. And in the same case and scenario, if that makeup brand wants to go to a large influencer to reach out to younger audiences, they could look to approach a mega influencer or a celebrity influencer that uh, you know could really stretch the budget on that but the objective that they would receive by that is really engaging into that brand awareness and developing and starting that journey for brand love for that given audience set that that influencer would have and it's important to note that these rates are not set in stone they're not the same for everyone because there's every a lot of things that come into account such as engagement rate audience size uh, gender, interest topic, um, as well as you know the usage rights that we've discussed. So as I said, these can vary significantly, but this slide kind of gives you an idea in regards to where they usually do fall into. And the key to incentivize creators is to work harder to draw customers deeper into the sales funnel. And that's really how you supercharge your campaign. And as I discussed, usually the industry sort of moving on from just keeping it to seeding or uh, fixed fee payments and being a little bit more intelligent with the data that's available and generated to introduce hybrid compensation models. So in that case and scenario, an example could be that an influencer is hired, uh, incentivized with you know, a flat fee to get the content created across different social media channels, and then introducing a performance-based incentive on top of that so that you're building that long-lasting relationship with the influencer so that once a content piece goes live and that ongoing relationship is there with the influencers, they can also still keep benefiting from the performance that they generate. And if a piece of content really takes off and goes viral, the influencer gets a bonus for their success even after the campaign has been run out. And it's starting to catch on. This stat pertains to that. So about 47% of influencers prefer this mode of payment 
because who doesn't like a reward for their hard work? There we go. And for creators, the benefits of working with brands can extend beyond payments as well. These partnerships can bring them more followers, right? From an influencer's perspective, think about it. Their audience size is a key piece. So if an influencer finds the right brand that they align with, it can help them increase that audience size as well. It can give them extra income and the stability of a longer term contract as well. They can also get insights into what items are selling best for brands and more. This creates a virtuous cycle between brands and their partners. Which leads us to a, quite a compelling example. I don't know if a lot of you guys know this YouTube influencer, he's quite famous in the US, Casey Neistat. He's an American filmmaker and YouTuber, uh, known for his authentic vlog style videos. So Casey actually attracted Nike's attention and instead of a typical ad style collaboration, Casey took on Nike's budget and traveled the globe for 10 days. The result was a four minute video which was called Make It Count, taken from the Nike Plus Fuel Band slogan, Life is a Sport, Make It Count. And Casey posted this video on YouTube and it went viral. It got over one and a half million views in three days and I think in today's date, it's somewhere around the 32 million. It could even be increased by now. And here's really where both the brand and the influencer can stay true to themselves and create this win-win situation. And why was this video so popular? It created brand love for Nike that was authentic to Casey's content and audiences. And this wasn't just a polished, hey, buy this now video or swipe up and you know go buy this product or the other. It was really a vlog style video that added value to the viewers themselves who were interested in adventure, taking risks or traveling the globe. And the brand's original goal was to form deeper relationship with Casey's audiences as well as their own audiences because that's where they were aligned as well. And as majority of millennials prioritize relationships with brands over price points, it makes sense to approach the partnership from that standpoint. And before we close out, let's look at the last pillar of our holistic approach to partnerships technology. All of this might sound like a lot of time consuming work. It doesn't have to be. And this is where the shameless plug comes in. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Impact.com's platform can automate, streamline many of these processes. So you can really win that time back and reallocate it to the important work of managing the actual campaign without getting bogged down in the little details of manual processes and build that long-lasting relationship with those influencers. Remember, right, at the beginning of the talk, we talked about how their businesses, businesses are run by people. As long as the brands are making long-lasting relationship with those influencers, that's really where that win-win situation and the example that I showed can come to fruition. Our platform can crawl social to help you find the ideal candidates, cast a wide net with automated recruitment emails and simplify contracting and flexible payments as well. It even tracks the partners and customers throughout every step of the buyer journey so creators can get appropriately and automatically rewarded for driving sales. So with the best creators galvanized by the right incentives and supported by the best technology, nothing will stop your influencer campaign from beating out the competition. Thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Can you all hear me now? Yeah? Um, so how do you recommend balancing limited influencer budgets with creator flat fees? Yep, so just sort of going back to the initial aspect that I spoke about, because this has a multi-tiered answer, right? I think from an influencer's perspective as well, 
if you are a brand asking this question is first of all understanding if it's a win-win situation if it's a win-win situation for an influencer as well as a brand the influencer is more likely to be flexible however from a brand's perspective as well it's quite important to make sure that a lot of the budget can be reallocated to influencer budgets because again think about it they've got their standing costs they've got the cost uh, of creating the content um, so that should always be taken into account uh, in regards to sort of budgets and flat fee, uh, what we actually see in our organization and within a lot of our clients is that the hybrid model is, is quite successful. So you are engaging the influencers um, from a perspective of that, you know, they want to work with you because you're aligned with them and there is that fixed fee so that their costs are covered. But introducing that element of performance that can help both the brand and the influencer grow together. Because there's always a risk, right? The risk is if you're not doing it right and your competition is, the net new audience that you might want to win might be diverted. And I guess that follows on then to the, to the next question where if you have a high value product, um, is it okay where more mid-tier influencers might accept product as payment or should you always budget for that, um, you know, that post fee on top? And you know, in, in my experience, we sometimes have it where influencers will say, I don't accept gifting. But if you were offering them a Gucci bag, it probably would so yeah. where, where do you find that balance and, and what does that look like I think this is a very very interesting question because that's where that one-to-one -one human aspect and that human touch is always important so you will have platforms that you know help you automate all of the processes but even from a tech providers perspective we always recommend to build meaningful one-to-one -one relationships with those influencers and that's really where you can get to know them Having a CRM or database in place will help understand what sort of influencers are attracted to what sort of compensation. And as you rightfully said, right, if it's uh, a high price product and if the interest topics are aligned with the influencer, the brand love is there, this sort of conversation doesn't become that sticking point where you are you know, having a conversation in regards to, oh, do I do that or that? It's about automating the processes that, are, that actually take a lot of time that get you to a space where you're going to be in a good relationship with an influencer and spending the time there to really understand what's going to drive the influencer not only today but if you're going to partner with them for the next 12 months on an evergreen campaign you know this can be de decided if they're happy to start off with a free product that they get and start reviewing it because they really love the brand or would they need the fixed fee payment because you know the campaign requires to uh, you travel somewhere and they've got costs associated with it. And I, I guess as well, like if you've got great relationships in place with influencers and it might not be the first time that you've worked together, then there might be options there where you can seed that out further and, and it grows. Um, I guess after this we break for lunch, so if you don't mind, we will. I think people are finding this quite helpful, so we'll probably answer a few more questions. But um, negotiating content buyout, why negotiate this at the beginning when we don't know if the sponsored content will perform well organically? Um, I think the last line of that question should be a motivator to do that anyway because by the end of the day from a brand's perspective ideally brands are sharing guidelines at least because the influencer content that is going out is going to carry the brand's name with it even though it's not produced by the brand it's partnered with the brand so it carries that brand image with it so there should be some guidelines that are set so there should be an idea from that perspective to see as that collaboration goes on what that content will be like now as that content goes live and you see how it performs organically having content rights can actually help cut the cost of content creation internally and then also getting the rights of republishing reboosting amplification on your own channels as well as a brand so there's many options because the other flip side of that coin is if it does it really well and the, um, the rights are not negotiated beforehand then you have the other problem right mm -hmm. so it's it's quite important to look at this aspect and have it as a part of your strategy i would definitely recommend teaming up with the content teams as well for brands to see how this content which is user generated influencer generated resonates with a brand's audience in general so that a brand can be in a better position to also manage their budgets not only for influencer payments or influencer technology and the time that's needed to run the channel but also from a content perspective right like by the end of the day we're all within 
the marketing division of any organization. And all of these little things will actually help a brand optimize internally to become more efficient with spend. Yeah. And as you said earlier in the talk as well, like influencers are businesses, like, you know, they have running costs. And, you know, if you're not negotiating those rates up front and they see how well it performs organically, they have leverage at that point and they're going to charge you a lot more for that content afterwards because they know how valuable it is. And at that point, your negotiating position isn't as, as strong as it would be. So, exactly. you know, you have uh, a few issues there. Um, another question is... Um, how do you approach rates with um, like TikToks? Um, because we have, you know, a lot of them are very inconsistent in engagement. Like one minute they're getting five million views, and the next it's five thousand. Um, you know, if you've got influencers that are charging a lot because they had one viral video where they got millions of views, yeah. um, how do you factor that into your negotiations? And, and how would you? Look to do that? I think that's a very good question and very interesting from the perspective of how TikTok has gained that traction and how. You're sort of also future-proofing yourself as a brand when it comes to TikTok because if you look at their target audiences in about five or so years, they're going to be quite powerful when it comes to purchasing decisions and actually hold a lot of uh, you know, wealth in that sense that is going to be turning into the spending power. So when it comes to negotiating with these TikTok influencers, again, data is very important, right? If a TikTok influencer has that one video or whatever it is and is basing the negotiation on the metrics of that, I think it's definitely in benefit for any brand having visibility and technology in regards to how the overall performance of that influencer is. And then from that point onward, start the negotiation. If you have data that signifies exactly where anyone stands in regards to their performance on you know, the TikToks they're putting out, Instagram they're putting out, or even tweets, for example, that data should be used as a part of the negotiation. And that's really where you're going to understand as a brand if the influencer is actually a good fit or not. Because an influencer can have, you know, one viral video that's sort of gone, done, did tremendously well. If it's in your niche, in your interest topic, aligning with the influencer and sort of teaming up with the right rate and getting the right compensation right could be a win-win situation for both. So even for the TikToker, it's not only what they're producing as content, it's for them to also learn and understand, okay, if this is a brand that aligns with my interest topic, how do I actually use this to grow my audience and grow my visibility? Yeah. A um, couple more questions. Uh, I think we've just got a, a little bit more time. Um, please, can you give an example of a performance-based incentive? Uh, what metrics do you use to measure success and how much would you pay per these metrics? So this is a very broad question and it ranges by industry, ranges by products, ranges again by you know the influencer niche that you're looking at as well as the audience size and the engagement. So on the performance side of things, you know, you've got your industry standards such as promo codes, but there is a lot more intelligent stuff that's out there. So again, sorry for the shameless plug again. A part of the platform is you know generating those tracking links in an automated way and really understanding that full user journey. Once a brand has visibility on that full user journey and all the metrics, it sort of allows the brand to think creatively in regards to how do we introduce performance in it. Or promo code's not relevant here because you don't want to be overcompensating multiple partners. Can we use a tracking link and say, give an introductory fee? So if an influencer is a part uh, of the journey, user journey, and is an introducer to the user journey, that can be provided a bonus as a part of performance. If the influencer is at the end of a journey and, um, you know, if it's a swipe up link that helps drive a sale, that can be uh, compensated accordingly as well. There is a lot of smart stuff out there now in today's day and age. Like, please come speak to us if you want to know more about this. But there is a lot of stuff uh, from a technology standpoint that can be achieved when it comes to understanding where in the journey that effect and causality can come into place and really define what part of performance would be relevant. And I guess as a caveat to that question, we have another question where uh, someone has asked, uh, what are your thoughts on creators using those performance metrics in their pricing? So rather than a, a creator saying, I charge 500 pounds, they're actually coming back to you and saying, well, actually my average cost per view is 12 pence yeah. and whatever the campaign performs, 
you'll pay accordingly. Do you see any, any movement in that side of the market? I think that's one of the trend um, that I think will become more and more prevalent as we move into the future, as creators also get access to this data, right? Like they have the data there, but now as they start working with brands that are you know data conscious, creators become data conscious. And then, as I said, by the end of the day, a long relationship will only work if it's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the day, if a creator can define such a compensation model that's a win for them and a win for the brand, that's an ideal scenario. Okay. Uh, last couple of questions. I know obviously that we're, we're starting to, to go ahead of time, but um, is it advisable to let an influencer know if you feel their rates are out of budget based on their engagement rates and views and so on? or just do it the polite way and say, sorry, we don't have budget for that? Do you think we should be educating the market more and, and, and letting creators know why they're overpriced? Or do you think that enough rejection at that level will just correct itself naturally? Um, I think in the long run, it might be the case, but I'm always a believer of one-to-one -one interaction and strong relationship building. So I think it should always be fed back because the creator could be a great creator and losing out on, let's say, a fixed fee of a thousand pounds, right? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, if you're educating the influencers and the influencers are educating you in regards to what they're getting from other brands, I think it's it's about defining that path that can lead to a win-win situation. Yeah, because we, we've seen it in the market a lot where, um, I don't know, we, we will work with an influencer, for example, they might charge 500 pounds hypothetically, uh, and then a brand might come in not knowing what that influencer charges and say, well, we'll offer you two thousand pound. Is that okay? Now, of yeah. course, the influence is going to go. Yeah, definitely, yes, I'll do it for that. But then they might be questioning themselves: Is that is that my real price? Yeah. Have, have I been too low? Should I be yeah. pricing myself at that level? So I guess that constant conversation of market forces um, is something that is an opportunity to build those closer relationships to to make sure that you're you're, you're benefiting the market and benefiting the influencer as well as the brands that, that you work with. Yeah. 100% and think about longevity in that example that you've just given there, right? So if an influencer does get that and they get paid that, the brand will also be constantly learning and then the brand will also be conversing with other influencers and they find out, oh, I've overpaid them in that last one. So that will look to correct itself in the long run anyway. But the key there in getting the sort of bedrock of compensation, right, is really understanding that alignment, right? So if it is an influencer that may have that value for a specific brand and they may not for another, it's about building those relationships. And as awareness metrics go, as performance goes, if everything is heading in the right direction from a campaign, it's by the end of the day, it's going to be about how that relationship evolves and if it can turn into uh, you know, a sort of ambassadorship. And that was the examples that I gave fairly early on with the uh, activewear company and the buy now, pay later organization that sort of used these experiments with compensation and then identified, okay, these are the influencers that we're aligned with. The influencers agreed. And then they went into sort of retainership and a year long yeah, contract yeah. with and influencers. I, I, that's, uh follows on nicely to the, to the last question is if you have a really good gifting relationship with an influencer is it wise to then break this and move on to spending on fixed fees so basically if, you, if you're getting a lot of content and, and relationships for, for free essentially yeah. um, is it wise to then be saying oh actually we're now going to pay for this um, like what would your views be on that I think it really depends upon the brand's budget strategy on that um, if they feel that they're getting more awareness and content out of just the influencer using their product if that's working well that's fine there may be different brands that you know in the last example that i gave of casey where it was not about you know wearing nike trainers and going for a run and like taking videos of that it's about imbibing it within your life as well so it's really about for a brand to understand where they sit with that relationship because remember right like we're not in the world of silos anymore where you know Pre-sales marketing is different, post-sales marketing is different. Yeah. It's about building that relationship with the customer and the audiences themselves. And then from a brand perspective, you're finding influencers where it's working. I personally think a brand should always be on the outlook and say, how do we make this better? Yeah. How do we optimize? So if gifting is working well, that's great. How do we supercharge this, right? How do we make it better? Will, you know, a sort of a thousand pound bonus uh, help to get that person out of their studio and travel somewhere and perhaps gain new audiences? Or will it actually work better because they've got already a lot of audiences and we want to give them a promo code and start creating them into an ambassador? Yeah. So these are the things 
that a decisions that really depend very heavily on data and should depend on data because it's there, data is available. And I guess the trade-off as well is that as you start to solidify those relationships, you'll probably then get access to more data because those con con campaigns will be more integrated. Exactly, and that's really like where everything is housed in and again, shameless plug, the CRM and the database side of things, right? It really holds it and keeps it. So even from an organizational perspective, if things are changing within your company and if things are changing, you know, people leave, uh, people carry on with their career. Having that right system of record to understand all of these things and make that continuously grow is really where we actually see a lot of brands come to us with their challenge, right? That, that this is what's happening. They've done A, B, and C. It's worked well. They've done D, E, and F. It's not worked well. But it's about normalizing all of that, importing it into one place, and then making it grow sustainably. Amazing. Well, uh, that concludes the uh, session. I knew that was going to be an interesting one. I knew that there was going to be a lot of questions, but thank you very much, Santorin. Thank you, everyone.